back to the Slow Flower Show with Deborah Prinzing, episode 554. The tagline for today's episode should be how to see nature's palette in deeper, more meaningful ways, because that's the lesson Lorene Edwards Forkner wants to share with everyone. As many of you know, Lorreen is a dear friend and inspiration to me in all things horticulture. She is an author, artist, and speaker. You can read her grow stories every week in the Sunday Seattle Times and catch her daily on Instagram at Gardener Cook, her popular feed. Lorreen is a past guest of the Slow Flowers podcast, and she was a featured presenter at the 2021 Slow Flowers Summit. We recently recorded a tour through her garden in Seattle, which led to Lorene's studio indoors, where she demonstrated the daily practice of seeing through a watercolor study of a winter pansy. This practice is also the topic of her forthcoming book, Color In and Out of the Garden. I had to wear pink in honor of this book's beautiful cover. I know you'll enjoy our episode today. Let's jump right in and meet Lorene. I'll share our sponsor thank yous at the end. Hi, Lorene. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> Tell us where we are. We're in my front garden, um, crammed with plants. Um, actually, I want something going on every day of the year, so. Uh, this is what it looks like in what early April. I'm so in love with the colors and the bloom colors are all fun uh, in your favorite rusty brown shade. Mm -hmm. Rusty brown and orange and you know I do love pink uh, but I always want to mess with it a little bit. I don't want just pastel pink. So the heathers blooming in kind of that plummy color. Um, so show me what you just picked. Did you you just picked a um... epimedium? Okay. Or bishop's hat, I think it is, which is is just like one of the world's most resilient ground covers. Right. It's right over here, right? Yes, right here. So great little heart shaped leaves, but you know, rock solid, sturdy, drought tolerant, doesn't ever need anything, no pest or anything. But then the flowers are this super delicate a lot of yeah. detail going on in them when you look at them up close. so you were saying that you have to think about size when you cut for your color studies because you want to photograph it on the uh, what five by five inch square uh, piece of all paper? my paintings are on and it's just a rule that i set for myself very early on in the game and it's it's just my rule and it's arbitrary all the paintings are four inches by four inches but if i put it on top of the painting to photograph it you can't you, you don't want to the cover painting. the painting, right? right. So, so you want some transparency. It's, yeah, it's just it's just one of my uh, little strictures I put in place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll follow Where you through your garden. Uh, let's see. The tulips are coming on. I'm all about obviously color. So trying when I get a tulip that matches the new growth on the heather, that starts zinging my little color. Oh, let's get a picture of that. Yes. So that's brown sugar tulip, and I don't remember the name of that. Possibly with more flame? Yes, it's just glowing. Yeah, and th that's the new growth. That's not the flower. Right, so. right. I see over there also that little euphorbia is going yeah. really nicely with the with the, the tulip too. Just a little moment right here. Right by the chain. Oh yeah, let's get some <laughs> rust in there. Cool. All right. Well, let, I'll follow you as you walk around. Okay, let's go to the back then. I mean, you know your garden so well. You sometimes come out here and know exactly what you're going to harvest, right? Yeah. Although I'm always starting to. I mean, look at the look at those fern crozers. Just like. I mean, I'm always looking at different stages of a mm -hmm. plant. Mm -hmm. so. You would you would totally do a study at that, right? Yeah, I did a week ago. I or thought so. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's that's just my favorite. Period. That kind of um, fuzzy new growth. Yeah, when you get to say furry crozier. Crozier, is that a term? I don't that's, know that. Yes, that's the, that's the furry crozier. Oh, I thought that was the fiddlehead. I guess. But a fiddlehead, I think, is also a, a crozier. crozier. That's, a, that's a more <laughs> accurate term. Right, that's a more fancy. <laughs> so fancy. So this is the backyard. Um, and obviously still has a great many plants. 
I'm always kind of experimenting in. Honestly, the front yard is far less maintenance with all the no ground, no bare ground. So Right, and you've been trying to add more cut flower yep. uh, options in the back. Yes, my three big troughs right now are planted in tulips that will all be in bloom in a couple of weeks. Did you hear that? Uh, <laughs> when the book publishes. So uh, I've planned this big show to celebrate uh, color in and out of the garden. Um, these have obliged. In fact, they kind of <laughs> overshot their, their deadline. They're kind of your uh, early release. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's my uh, good medicine to get me through the next few weeks of busyness. Um, well, it's kind of in your preferred palette as well. Yeah, I, I do. I, once I have a palette, I just run with it and, and look into all the permutations. And I promise you, somewhere you know, whether it's the anemones or the bulbs or something, something red will show up. Yes. Because it always does. Yes. Um, Not that you necessarily remember planting it. No, it's usually because it's mislabeled. Yes. <laughs> it I, just, love I love it. it. It dares to show up always. Well, that lime euphorbia is crazy, though, in terms of just giving yes. you sort of an, a carpet. Yeah. And that, again, a rock-solid, durable ground cover, um, Loved by the honeybees, or the early native bees at this time of the year, great source of nectar. So. Yeah, and I mis mischaracterized it. I thought it was Mercenides, but it's, you said it's Rigida? I think it's Rigida. It, oh, Rigida. You know, honestly, these are all seedlings that have um, just established, and, and the seeds are little round marbles. It cracks me up because they roll. So. They just drop <laughs> yes, and, and they... drop and root. <laughs> I love it. Okay, you said you had something that you were going to clip in the back behind your little your little structure. Yeah, this is um, what I'm going to paint today. I'm going to stop teeny, little tiny little pussy willow is blooming. Your salix is starting to leap out. Yeah, it's like salix weapons. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So I want to paint this petal today because it has a heart and sometimes you just do a petal study you don't need the whole flower right because again if this on a four by four piece of paper would cover most of yeah. the painting um yeah but i love the heart detail. yeah it's kind of fun oh that's fun okay Corny, but fun yeah so love it okay should we go into your studio all right Okay, part two of our uh, wonderful episode. We've just toured Lorene's garden with her, and I want to reintroduce my guest, Lorene Edwards Forkner. Hi, Lorene. Hi, Deborah. We're in your Seattle studio. Uh, Lorene is um, has many accolades, and I'll share her bio in our uh, show notes. But um, she is uh, first and foremost a dear friend and an inspiration as an artist in my life. And um, many of you met Lorene on the podcast in 2019. You came and met me when I was in a, on a deadline, and I said, Lorene, can, can we just do an interview about... But there were flowers, and yes. I'll go anywhere there are yes, flowers. that's <laughs> right. It was, it was in July, and we were I was producing a wedding, and you came and met me at the Seattle Wholesale Growers Market, and we talked about this really cool practice that you have developed that you started um, more than four years ago, and uh, at the time, people were so fascinated following you on Instagram and kept saying... You, this should be a book. And lo and behold, it's a book. So show us the cover. Um, very, very subtle. You might miss it. <laughs> I love it. Um, I mean, my I was, sunglasses. Yeah, right? It's like it's seen from space. Um, color in and out of the garden um, arrives in the world in just a little over two weeks from when we're filming this on April 26th. That's awesome. Okay, great. And this is going to air on the 15th. Plenty of time for people to get their pre-orders in, right. and um, we'll talk more about that later. Remind me what the subtitle is, because it's, oh, cool, it's a cool it's, explanation. It, it is a very... Publishers love subtitles. Uh, watercolor Practices for Painters, Gardeners, and Nature Lovers. Mm. Although the book is not a how-to. There is a chapter at the back about, you know, play along, tell me what you see, you know, dip your brush, play, you know, just have some fun. Um but the book is is actually just about color. I mean, I, this is not botanical illustration. Mm -hmm. um, this is just celebrating and identifying colors in the natural world. 
you organize it in a way by color groups, right? Yes, I always had this notion. I wanted to book uh, in the in a rainbow spectrum, so I call it the Roy G. Biv world. You know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. In fact, and I think that was a hashtag. You're using. <laughs> it is. I love. I love Roy G. Biv. So my my. Um, my original idea was we would arrange the color studies by the colors of the rainbow. So here's red, and then we do orange, and then, and my theory at least was that it would, you know, as you flipped, you would see the colors of the rainbow. Because I think there's something very compelling to all humans about, you know, we see a rainbow in the sky, we can't help but be compelled to look at it. Oh, absolutely. Um, th- but that was a little rudimentary. Um, and I like to think we, we developed over the course of uh, working with my editor. Um, but it is still organized by color. And rather than just have that simple, um, straight, you know, like the straight. straight spectrum, what I ended up doing is, you know, red is actually a chapter about attention. Mm. It captures our attention. And mm. orange is... Um, you know, more about energy. There's a tremendous amount of energy to orange. And the memory chapter I did is yellow. Green is obviously for growth. Uh, blue was about vulnerability and tenderness. And then violet at the end is about always choosing love. So the book actually became sort of a memoir in plants and color and paying attention mm. or mindfulness. Mm. And those traits are so relatable uh, when you say them, although if you had said to me, well, what would be the, what would be the the emotion that comes to mind when you think of blue? I don't know that I would have necessarily thought about tenderness, but um, did, is that the one you said? Mm-hmm. Was, yeah. Vulnerability and tenderness. Yeah, I just love that. That's wonderful, and it's a way to draw people in who don't think that they're artists. Right. And I don't think I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is debatable. <laughs> I'm an attention artist. Okay, what does that mean? Um, that I, I really do say it, and this is, you know, just my own neuroses I'm working around, but I'm an attention artist, but I make marks in watercolor. Mm. So I really feel like the skill or the artistry that I bring to this practice, practice is noticing. Mm. And, and then really in sharing these works with the world, I'm just pointing at, which that's what artists do, is they point to something and say, hey, look at this. Um, and you're also documenting a moment in time, which I think artists do as well. Like right. um, your garden is, you know, it's early April and it's a light and color. If you capture those images, and let me just say, it's not all color because you might pa- paint a pebble or a piece of right. bark. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's, it is that time stamp and it's, the palette <clears throat> is going to look, look different as we move through right the, the different seasons right i've uh, people often ask me you know how do you find something new to paint all the time it's like well but i don't you know mm. i'm i'm painting the same things again and again and again i i painted this shell i leave my my shells are always right here um mm-hmm. i i tell people that shells are my scales i used to play the piano and you had to practice your yes, your scales yes i love that analogy um because First of all, they're right there. I don't have to sit here and think of something to paint. I can just pull it and do the act of painting because it's the act of painting that is the groundingness it, or the paying attention and recording that. Um, and so I, sh- shells are my s- scales, and they also remind me that of that link to tides. It's mm-hmm. like sometimes the tide comes in, it's just crashing over my head, um, and but it always goes out. It always, you know, there's a rhythm mm-hmm. to all of it. So the... This- how often are you doing shelves? Like once a week, or it's it's not, it's it's not um, it's not a regular yeah, interval. It's it's when your your <clears throat> muse tells you to do a shelf. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Or if we've had oysters the night before. <laughs> okay, so now you uh, agreed to show us a little bit about your approach. Uh, when we were in the garden, you you clipped a pansy. That's another. Uh, um, botanical that you've painted many times. I do. I do. I love I love pansies in the garden. I love their simplicity in as a plant to grow. Mm-hmm. They're just mm-hmm. almost uh, impossible to not be successful with. But I'm always looking for ones that have, you know, very sophisticated colorings. Um, and so they, you know, they look like a watercolor already. 
Um, but this yeah. is what I was saying. If you pick a giant, um, a giant <clears throat> bloom. flower or yeah. bloom, um, you're going to end up covering up the painting. Um, so, and which is fine. I mean, sometimes it's, again, I, it's, I'm getting the enjoyable part. Um, but, but I often will deconstruct um, a petal or a plant right. to show right. something else. So this one, I've got um, this single petal because I think that's mm. super corny, but very sweet that it it's has a heart. a heart on it. Right, and then it fits within the frame so nicely. Right, right. I'm thinking of, like when someone buys your book and is, is wants to inspire to do their own thing, there's nothing preventing them from a, a reader to take a 12 by 12 inch Absolutely. square and do something Absolutely. larger. Right? Yeah, this is strictly arbitrary that I set this up um, as my rules, as it were, um, you know, four years ago. Yeah. And I, you know, people ask me what's next and, you know, it's like maybe, maybe bigger. I don't know. Have you ever had a day that you did not post? No. Okay. So it's, it's hard to imagine like, well, I think the one thing you said about the mindfulness practice at the Slow Flower Summit that struck me, and I think it resonated with a lot of people, is, you know, the objection that well, I don't have the I don't have the discipline to do something every day. Right. And you said, but you brush your teeth every day. And I thought, oh yeah, well, there's that. <laughs> Hopefully, um, and and I really will say that, you know, I set myself up to be. Um, for this to happen. I mean, I make, I make habits. It is a habit that I try and maintain, but I set myself up to be successful at maintaining the habit, mm -hmm. which um, I wish I could do that for a lot of my other habits. But, uh, and I'm very lucky that I have this space in our old house. My kids are grown and, and I just have sort of taken over the upstairs. And so my paints stay out, my dirty water stays out. Everything is right here where I can pop in whenever I want to. I love that you have a skylight right above the desk. I know. So you're getting this beautiful light. <clears throat> Maybe it's too hot sometimes, but you yeah. do it in the morning or something like that. Right? I And I only paint by natural light because light is actually the source of color. Mm -hmm. And so light tremendously has an impact on color. Mm -hmm. And overhead light, if it's an incandescent bulb, will turn everything um, yellow, uh, fluorescent is a horrible kind of blue color. Um, yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. You paint by natural light and then you're doing photography by natural right. light. Right, all of it by natural light. So the, my window of painting is very short in Seattle in the wintertime. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can sleep in and still paint because it won't get bright until 10. That's right, and then it's going to get dark at 3.30, so... Okay, well, can we see, can we watch you while you're working? And I'm going to tilt the camera so people will see your hands and not uh, your face because I want them to see how your setup is. You have a lot of, uh, a lot of paint and a lot of little mixing vessels and your workstation. So how, right. how do you get started? So um, I'll just describe very briefly. These are my paints that I use. This is a... Oh. These were gifts, Sennelier. Um, it's a lovely paint. It's a gift. I have worked for years with this um, Prima, mm -hmm. which is not as nice a paint, but there's some pretty fun colors on it. And then these are a little tiny palette of Daniel Smith watercolors that are fabulous. Mm -hmm. And honestly, you can see that there are some paints that I don't use very often and others that are, you know, Empty. completely gone. Right. Um, so that kind of... You can, it, that's the, in a perfect world, I could pick your, figure out those colors and just put that together. But like I said, I call it my vocabulary. This is what's familiar to me because I've been doing this for four years. So the little cards in the lids of the paint boxes are mixes that, or studies that you've previously done. They, uh, and they're all spattered, uh -huh. uh, but that's this color. So that's what it looks like. <laughs> If it were clean. It's like your key. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Because paint looks very different in the palette. Um, you sure. know, for instance, these three purples are really distinct, but here they just mm. look like black mm -hmm. almost. You might be using those with the pansy then. Yes. Yes. This is one of my favorite colors. Um, and I, I put whatever it is I've decided to paint on a piece of paper um, that's the same size. Because I, I am... It was drilled into me 
um, from my er very earliest art classes to pay attention to composition. Mm -hmm. um, and also, being on white, I can, I, I can better identify the colors, kind of pay attention and isolate right, them without distraction. Cast, there's no color cast on right. the petal. It's just the reflection of the white. Mm -hmm. um, I always have um, a swatch because I... Oh my goodness. I sample all my paints before I lay them down and I save all of these. I, these are actually one of my favorite parts of this whole practice. Um, I just think there's a lot of liveliness to these little test swatches. So people are always like, well, how, how do you make that color match? It's like, well, hopefully you get better at something you've done every day for four years. Um, but on the other hand, I'm always testing, always, always, always testing. So it's kind of a hunt and peck. Um, and, and some days I don't make it. Some days I'm disappointed in my results. But, uh, and I talk about this in the book, it's, it's like that's the beauty of a daily practice is that it's constancy and also it's forgiveness because you have tomorrow. Lorraine, um, what about the paper? Do you have a particular type of paper that you like to use or is any watercolor paper fine? I use a 140 pound cold press. Cold press has a little bit more of an organic toothiness to it. Okay. Um, and honestly, the reason I work with 4x4 four four is four years ago, I started with a piece that was 4x8 and I cut it in half for efficiency's sake. And um, So yeah, it's, again, it's very arbitrary. <laughs> no, no, it's also a typical artist's uh, sort of resourcefulness. Like, use what you right. have. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, these, the brush that I use is the one that I've started with four years ago. It's looking definitely worse for the weather by now. Um, it's a reservoir brush that holds water, but I don't do it that way. I just like it because it's a square tip, and that's kind of my characteristic square mark. Mm. Um, I mix the paints on a white porcelain uh, palette for the same reason that I put the petal or plant or rock mm -hmm. or shell on white as it Got helps it. me identify colors. Um, I'm obviously, this is a very cleaned up palette because this was a special day. Um, <laughs> We're, we, we feel fortunate. Yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, n natural colors often have a mutedness to them. So, um, and the beauty of watercolor is you can always re-wet it. So mm -hmm. maybe, again, that's resourceful mm -hmm. or... Um, efficient mm -hmm. but you know i can i can re-wet this and it's like that's pigment that's i don't want to waste that it yep. comes alive mm -hmm. okay. great and the same reason why i will often have um some dirty water and you know it's not dirt it's pigment mm -hmm. um and that can go a long ways towards toning the colors that i'm oh, trying to achieve if so. something's too bright and it's yeah. a little bit of dirty water which is as you said pigmented water mm -hmm maybe gives it a little bit of a dullness or right or... so most paint box colors are not something you would find in nature <laughs> um or if if you did it would be remarkable you would yeah because it's unbelievable they're so, so va saturated right 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 wow and so um you talked about the little card the the the, the swatch card and is that what you start with then right so um and i can't talk while i'm doing this that's I've okay. tried <laughs> can, can i you can, can talk. talk? Okay. Yeah, and, and I can answer questions. I just can't. They may not Narrative. be. Narrative. You can't <laughs> right. narrate what you're doing. Exactly. This is so fun because there are uh, nine, there's room for nine squares on your finished page. But you are making many more colors sort of swatches to get to those nine. And sometimes you don't do all nine. Yeah, sometimes I Sometimes I've even um, cut out a pick, one of them that I wasn't happy with. <laughs> I see that. I love like, it when you said I, you, I, I have, <laughs> you use your little embroidery snips, snips to cut out a square. It's like off with your head. Mm. Mm. Okay, so. Purple is hard. Why did I choose purple? Well, the thing is, we, we, um, I find when I look at your Instagram feed that I'm seeing colors that I, I have to go back then and look at the botanical to find where it is because 
you've taken the time to do that looking for me. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm thinking, oh, it's mainly a purple pansy with a little splotch of yellow. But now I'm seeing the depth of the veining and the throat and the, mm-hmm. you know, the fading, um, I guess, tone on the edge of the petal versus the uh, as it gets closer to the center. So this is helpful though, to see how your square brush is is just a great tool. Yeah, it's doing it for me. Um. And then do you ever go back over those large colors and, and say, make it darker or look? Yep, okay. absolutely. And that's where um, I, I think what I've landed on, if there's been a, a progression or a growth in the color studies that I've done, is I've landed on you know, I say I'm not an artist, but each one of these little squares is a landscape painting of a particular, mm. you know, s- mm-hmm. teeny tiny section of, you know, maybe a single petal. Um, but it's, it is the, that's well, as close as I'll get that's to saying a, I'm a painter. That's a good example. You know, and I think that you, um, you and I have talked about the fact that um, if you were going to do landscape painting you could just cut up all these squares and assemble them mm-hmm. because they represent they represent natural color in the landscape right they already are uh brush strokes in a lance of mm-hmm. a landscape mm-hmm. so um what can i yeah these are all the things i think about and mm. so now you're adding a little more pink to get that higher to... tone yeah trying to get the and I know this is hard because we're watching you. <laughs> I think we'll do we'll do a couple more squares and then we'll um, we'll let you finish and just show the end, show the final result. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you taught at the uh, when you lectured at the um, summit, which was so lovely, you really told the story of how this practice began, and we'll share I'll share that video in our show notes so people can go oh, watch nice. the whole presentation yeah. because you had. Um, you know, you had a slideshow basically, and then after the slideshow, you challenged everyone to grab their little, little tiny dot cards of color and choose a flower or a, a leaf and start um, trying this. And it really, uh, it's not like you have to teach this. I think people, you have to give just... people the, the materials mm-hmm. to start with, and the um, prompts maybe, right. To, you know, identify is a color warm or is a color cool, and what does that mean? And um, mm, right, and the observations could take longer, but they could also just be um, you grow into it. You get a little bit more critical as a, a, a viewer if you do this every day. I know. I I I laugh when I say this because I think it sounds dangerously like I'm hearing voices. Um, <laughs> But I see more than I used to see. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I have just the way my eyes absorb things. I, I see more detail. I don't, I don't know how else I, to I'm say. I'm so glad to hear that because you started this practice as a way to create order at a time when you were grieving mm-hmm. and you wanted to just have some things that structured your day. Right. I'm maybe mischaracterizing that, but. Um, you write about it in the book. Right. This, you know, I I really wanted um, to participate in the 100-day project. And um, this is, we can talk about more of that. Yeah. Um, but it's, it was, my dad had just died. And I was, I was fortunate to be very much a part of um, his illness and his, you know, I got to say I got to walk him home along with my mom and my family and Mm -hmm. that was that was all wonderful but I was used up I didn't have much left um and so I didn't I didn't know what I could do so I wanted something very very simple um and this with a lot of uh influence from people other artists that I've seen Mm -hmm. this was kind of where I landed on um and it was simple I just had to follow the instructions just like (laughs) <laughs> well, your thing about observing color in and out of the garden, in a way, the first, as I recall, one of the first times you participated in the 100-day project, 
it was a color study, but you were you were actually uh, finding at plants that reflected the, the rainbow colors in your garden. The right? first time I did um, the 100 Day Project was in 2016, I believe, and it was called My Roy G. Biv World. Mm-hmm. And so it was nice because, you know, there are seven colors in the spectrum. There are seven days of the week. So on Monday, I would do reds. And it wasn't even just in the garden. It was just like in the environment. Mm. And it would just be a series of red photos. In your life. In my life, okay. that day. That so day was be, red. It could be the handle on a vintage uh, kitchen knife or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was um, it was great because, again, it was iterative. It, it was like, it was in that sequence of mm-hmm. repetition. And, you know, I didn't have to, I didn't have to think of all the colors at one time. Mm-hmm. I could just focus on <laughs> right. one. Right. Um, so that was great fun. And, and again, so much of, Um, what I like about posting it on Instagram is you have the accumulation and you can see it as it rolls out. It is literally an accumulation of days. Um, (laughs) So if people scroll back far enough, (laughs) it is at Gardener Cook. I guess they'd have to go back five years and could see what you had done with that, um, that Roy G. B. of World um, study. I bet you could... You could search the hashtag my Roy G. Biv world. Yeah, we'll put that in there for people. That would be fun. But all of that to say, it was a familiar enough exercise that when you came around to um, wanting to start again in 2018, you had, was it 2018? I did it in 2017 as okay. well, but it was, I was... That was a different exercise. Yeah, it was a different exercise. Well, you started this practice, and you you kind of knew I, you knew what they needed you to. Do. I knew how much color meant to me, mm. and that that was it was going to provide comfort as well as direction, um, mm. and it it wasn't going to engage a lot of skill. Right. Um, it was you know like make the colors. Um, so what happened to you when you started the process, like emotionally, were you able to just have less anxiety or it's, sadness? Do you recall those feelings? It's, um, you know, I don't think you really have less sadness. I think you just learn to sit better with mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. Um, and to recognize, um, and, the, and those first 100 days taught me this, that part of the reason why I had such sadness was because I had so much love yeah. and that it mm. tied the two together. So mm. in addition to the paintings, every day I'm posting a little essay or an observation or a quip. I mean, sometimes it's really just a smart-ass remark. Um, <laughs> but in response to what that plant right, has taught you. Right. I am engaging with, and, and, you know, it's a diary of sorts, I guess, mm-hmm. although... I've never been able to keep a diary. Um, so that that first 100 days, what I said on the first day was, this is me, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I hope to watch play out over the next 100 days. Um, at that point, that grief was pretty raw. It had only been about a week and a half since Dad passed, and... Um, and I said, you know, everyone knows time heals and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, show me. Yeah, let's see if that really is, yeah. that adage is really. And it, it, it is the process, not necessarily when you're being filmed and interviewed at the same time. <laughs> uh, but generally, the process is very quieting. Um, that as I'm concentrating on a color, I really, all the other noise goes away. And... Um, so in that respect, it is a very mindful and therefore relieving, you know, all the other stresses of the day are, you know, kind of take a back seat for yeah, we're kind of 10 interrupt. minutes. Yeah, we're, we're interrupting that. that we're interrupting your, My wah. Your, 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 your mellow. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's okay. We want people absolutely, to get excited absolutely. about. Absolutely. And, and that's part of why I love, it's not really teaching it, it's guiding guiding it you know if I can set somebody up like we did at the slow flowers and um I have some other events coming up it's like to to watch people get that to watch people say 
you know, that little thrill of like, oh, yes, that, that is really, really close to the color I was trying for. Um, oh, yeah, I love and, it. And there's a little chime that sort of goes off in people. And I love it when I hear people go, oh, it's like, yes. Right. Um, right. Oh, and my it's, gosh. it's such a simple, accessible practice. Yes. yes. Um, and I think, you know, the world has not gotten less complicated in the last four years. Right. Right. Um, and so I really rely on having this toolkit of um, stress relief, I guess, or just just simple <laughs> stress release. Yeah, and I just think... <laughs> Meditation. Yeah, and I just think that's really why it's so exciting that we're getting the... We're watching your book get out in the world, Lorraine, because um, you've heard from so many people who've been inspired by what you're posting on Instagram, and they want to take their own curiosity about seeing and observing further and you know the book is sort of gives them a little bit of a roadmap I think it does um like I said this you know at at, at first there was some talk about oh here I talk about shells mm. um at first there was some talk about it being a how-to watercolor book and it's like but I'm not a watercolorist I don't yeah. know the technical pigments and sometimes that gets me in a lot of trouble <laughs> um so what I'm trying to do is to teach people to see. Mm. Um, so anyway, we, we put this at the last chapter of the book. What do you see? Mm. And, you know, talk about be gentle, forgive yourself, show up the next day. But, you know, here it says making time to look deeply enriches the way we see the world. Mm. And I will say that four years of paying attention like this, I see more. But I also see I, I have a greater level of compassion. But anyway, here's the, you know, a little kind of setup. Here, these are your colors. This is what they are. This is their personalities. You know, mixing is the secret sauce. <laughs> um, and and so, yeah, there's my dirty palette. That's all paint. Um, and then, then yeah, then that's kind that's of... That's what we're just watching yep, today. that's it. That's wow. it. And there it's you have like it. It's like you're visually deconstructing... Um, as well as, I mean, in this case, you did deconstruct a table mm -hmm. one petal, but sometimes you do the whole, like the epimedium, you do the whole bloom. Right. And um, your eye has to really observe and separate out each right. other. Right. That's, and that's, you know, in this instance, it's, it's, you know, it's separating out all the different colors, oh but then, gosh. you know, most people would say, well, it's a white clamshell. But it's it's got those purples and pinks and and it's got a great deal of yellow in it too. Right, and sometimes um, your squares are not solid. You've done a little wash. Right, I and, saw you did that on the pansy one. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of the landscape aspect mm -hmm. of it. It's you know like of just a teeny tiny little. We're bleeding almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh my gosh. Well, this has been so amazing. And the good news is that uh, Lorene's publisher has given us two books to do as a giveaway. So when we post this to the podcast, we'll get the rules for how you can um, be part of a random drawing of um, listeners and viewers to maybe win one. But if you want to see where Lorene is appearing and uh, either virtually or in person, you have an event calendar on your website, ahandmadegarden.com, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Not well, that I've updated it lately, but... <clears throat> well, you will by the time the book comes out. <laughs> yes. what, what, else on do you, what else do you want people to know? Um, they can order lots of goodies um, on your online <laughs> shop. You have prints of many of these. Uh, right. Pieces. I've done um, basically, you know, the final step of this process is I put the plant or the shell or the rock or something. Mm -hmm. And I, I snap a picture mm -hmm. with my iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, and I do a little bit of color correction simply because, um, again, the color of the light changes mm -hmm. everything. I try to get no. it back to what it's supposed to be. Um, and then, <clears throat> then I have a photographic record. So that's what gets uploaded to Instagram along with whatever that observation. So when I post this tomorrow, I will talk about... Um, Everybody pay attention and watch for the Slow Flowers podcast. Awesome. That's Deb great. will tell me the right thing to say to <laughs> actually get people to it. So it's, it's you know, again, that journal. Um, I have played around with, because as you might imagine, uh, I have a lot of these. 
I have lots and Wait, lots and lots. Over four years of 365 days? Yeah, we're well, getting close to 2,000 already. Yeah, yeah, because wow. I think at the summit last year, we were pretty close to 1,500. Wow, that's fabulous. Um, so I have done some installations where I put them up on the wall, um, mm. and it's just staggering to it, it's to see that to see that a, a life it is yeah. you know, um, but I also you know in in the books that I'm selling on my website the signed books I'm including um, one of these original oh. color studies. Oh, um, I love it. Just a little piece of me. Well, it is a love story to your relationship with the natural world because you know there's a universal universality about it but there's also this highly personal component that only you're <laughs> painting what only you are seeing exactly yeah. and it, somebody else will have a slightly different color study of the same flower exactly and and uh you know the japanese have a, a saying i think i put it in pink um that Ichi e ichigo, which means basically for this moment only, mm, um, mm. that this is what I see in this petal today. Mm. Um, and I could paint, you know, the shells, which I do paint all the time, but I'm I'm different each time I paint the shell. Mm. The light is different. Um, you right. know, my emotional mix is different. Mm -hmm. uh, so I love that notion of a timestamp. I think that's what I've come away with. Almost as much as anything. I mean, certainly the the notion that I feel like I have this tool that is um, a meditative release because I I will never do a sitting meditation um, and I don't really journal. Um, so this is this is my practice. Mm, it's inspiring. It's so inspiring, and I love getting to be a fly on the wall when I see <laughs> what you've posted. Sometimes I um, we've. I've seen you paint things that we've collected together. We painted together. <laughs> we did that last summer. After this little summer. Side summer, by we, side. We got to paint together. And uh, I just hope it inspires people to um, engage with their flowers and their plants um, a little in a little maybe different medium than just growing and cutting, even though that's an art form in and of itself. When you change media, I think it also it's a little disrupting in, in a good way. It forces you to look, mm -hmm. look at mm -hmm. things differently. So It can be play. That's true. Thank you so much, Lorraine. This has been so much fun, and um, I'm excited to uh, get these books out in the hands of more of your fans, and um, thanks for sharing your story with us. Thank you very much. Here, we'll, we'll line this puppy up. What do you mean? Make them as wallpaper? Uh, well, yeah, I, I've, I've played around with the idea of, you know, doing a wallpaper or spoon flower fabrics or something. Um, but actually, to, I have all these paintings. I want to do, like, installation boards. Obviously not. Oh <laughs> not many people have room to put this much up, but, you know, just a segment of it. Oh, my know. gosh. And I, I love it. It could be a big print. Or, but I'm talking about with the actual paintings. Like if I did a piece of foam core and mounted, you know, 18 paintings on it, and then that, people could do what they wanted with it. Hey, thanks so much. That last little segment was a bonus. We walked down to uh, Lorene's uh, bedroom where she has created this mural uh, using all of her four by four inch watercolor studies. Not all, but a lot of them. And I just thought it was so stunning. I wanted to capture the the impact of that mini all in one place. So thanks again for joining us today. Be sure to check out the show notes for episode 553 at slowflowerspodcast.com when we air the audio uh, next week, uh, April 20th. Or look for our book giveaway rules at Slow Flower Society on Instagram. Thanks to Lorene's publisher, Abrams, we have two copies of Color In and Out of the Garden to give away. We'll draw names on Sunday, April 24th and announce the winners the following week. Before I go, I'd love to thank our sponsors who bring the show to you. This show is brought to you by slowflowers.com, the free online directory to more than 880 florists, shops, and studios who design with local, seasonal, 
and sustainable flowers, and to the farms that grow those blooms. It's the conscious choice for buying and sending flowers. And thank you to our lead sponsor, Farm Girl Flowers. Farm Girl Flowers delivers iconic burlap wrap bouquets and lush, abundant arrangements to customers across the U.S., supporting U.S. flower farms by purchasing more than $10 million of U.S. grown fresh and seasonal flowers and foliage annually. Discover more at farmgirlflowers.com. Thank you to the Gardener's Workshop, which offers a full curriculum of online education for flower farmers and farmer florists. Online education is more important than ever, and you'll want to check out the course offerings at thegardenersworkshop.com. Thank you to Details Flowers Software, a platform specifically designed to help florists and designers do more and earn more. With an elegant and easy-to-use system, Details is here to improve profitability, productivity, and organization for floral businesses of all shapes and sizes. You can grow your bottom line through professional proposals and confident pricing with their all-in-one platform. All friends of the Slow Flower Show will receive a seven-day free trial of Details Flowers software. Learn more at detailsflowers.com. And thank you to Cal Flowers, the leading floral trade association in California, providing valuable transportation and other benefits to flower growers and the entire floral supply chain, both in California and 48 other states. The association is a leader in bringing fresh cut flowers to the U.S. marketplace and in promoting the benefits of flowers to new generations of American consumers. You can learn more at cafgs.org. The Slow Flower Show is member supported and I value our loyal members and supporters. If you're new to our weekly show or our long running podcast, check out all of our resources at slowflowerssociety.com and consider making a donation to sustain Slow Flower's ongoing advocacy, education, and outreach activities. You can find the donate button at slowflowerspodcast.com. I'm Deborah Prinzing, host and producer of The Slow Flower Show and The Slow Flowers Podcast. Next week, you're invited to join me in putting more slow flowers on the table, one stem, one vase at a time. The content and opinions expressed here are either mine alone or those of my guests alone, independent of any podcast sponsor or other person, company, or organization. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I'll see you 